1969, Woodstock, moon landing, and somewhere in America, a guy named Jimmy just launched his Chevelle so hard that he literally left his rear axle on the starting line. The Ford 9-inch, the Dana 60, the GM 12-bolt, the Mopar 8 and 3 quarters. These weren't just chunks of iron bolted under muscle cars, they were the final link between a thousand horsepower dreams and brutal reality. The difference between crossing the finish line first or watching your competition disappear in your rearview mirror while you're stranded with twisted metal where your axle used to be. But here's what's gonna blow your mind. While every muscle car on the planet was running these bulletproof solid axles, one manufacturer did something absolutely insane. They threw out the rule book completely and built something that shouldn't have worked, but changed everything. Today, we're breaking down the rear ends that made legends possible. Four iron warriors that defined an era and one revolutionary design that proved sometimes the best way to win is to play a completely different game. Trust me, that last one is going to start arguments that are still raging today. Part one, Ford 9-inch, The Immortal. Let's start with the rear end that refuses to die. Ford introduced this beast in 1957 for their full-size cars, but by the mid-60s, something incredible happened. Hot rodders discovered they had accidentally stumbled onto the strongest, most versatile rear axle ever mass-produced. The secret was in the design. While everyone else was building rear ends where you had to tear apart the entire housing to change gears, Ford created something brilliant. The entire differential assembly, the gears, the carrier, everything, came out as one complete unit. They called it a third member, but racers called it genius. Picture this. You're at the drag strip. Your gear ratio isn't working. With any other rear end, you're done for the day, maybe the whole weekend. But with this setup, you could swap out the entire center section in your pit area in under an hour. Drag racers started carrying multiple third members like spare tires. One set up for the street, another for the track. Want to try a different gear ratio? Pop out the old unit, drop in the new one, and you're back in business. But it wasn't just the convenience. This thing was built like a nuclear bunker. The ring gear was massive. The pinion support was over-engineered. The housing was thick enough to stop bullets. You could literally weld reinforcement tabs directly to the case without worrying about cracking it. Within 10 years, everyone was using them. Chevy guys were embarrassed to admit it, but they were ripping out their factory rears and welding in housings. Mopar guys were doing the same thing. Even import racers eventually discovered what American hot rodders had known for decades. Here's the crazy part. Ford stopped putting these in passenger cars in 1986, but the aftermarket said, not so fast. Companies started manufacturing brand new housings, third members, even complete assemblies. Today, you can buy a stronger version of this rear end than Ford ever made from the factory. 40 plus years after Ford moved on, this is still the gold standard for serious performance builds. That's not nostalgia talking. That's engineering that was so far ahead of its time, it's still ahead of our time. But stick around. That curveball we mentioned, the rear end that broke all the rules, it's coming. And it's going to flip everything you think you know about putting power to the ground. Part 2, Dana 60, The Destroyer. When Chrysler needed something strong enough to handle a 426 Hemi or a 440 with attitude, they didn't mess around. They called Dana Corporation and said, build us something that can handle anything. Dana's answer was beautiful in its brutality. This wasn't just strong, it was agricultural equipment strong, the kind of rear end you'd find under a semi-truck or a piece of farm machinery. Chrysler took that design and said, yeah, let's put this under a Challenger. The ring gear was enormous. We're talking serious diameter here. The axle shafts were thick enough to use as crowbars. 
The housing was cast with enough material to build a small bridge. But here's what made it legendary among Mopar guys. While other manufacturers were making compromises, lighter weight, easier manufacturing, lower cost, Dana built this thing with one goal. Never, ever break. Street racers loved the stories. There were legends of guys running nitrous, slicks, and violent launches, and the only thing that survived was the rear end. Engine blown, transmission scattered, but the axle was still solid and ready for more abuse. NASCAR teams figured this out early. When you're running 500 miles at 190 miles per hour, with cars bumping and grinding for position, you need something that won't give up under pressure. The heavyweights became the standard for cup car racing, but it came with a price. This thing was heavy, really heavy. In a Challenger or Cuda, that extra weight was sitting right over the rear wheels, which actually helped with traction. But in a lighter A body like a Dart or Duster, you really felt the penalty. Smart builders learned to work with it instead of against it. The extra weight became part of the setup. Launch harder, hook better, and let the strength handle whatever punishment you could dish out. Even today, if you're building something that's going to make serious power, and we're talking four-digit horsepower numbers, this is probably what's going under your car. Not because it's the most advanced, because when failure isn't an option, you choose the rear end that's never learned how to quit. Keep watching, though. That revolutionary design we've been hinting at? The one that changed everything? You're not going to believe what one manufacturer had the guts to try. Part 3. GM 12 Bolt. The Sweet Spot. General Motors had a different philosophy. They looked at Ford's tank and Chrysler's destroyer and said, What if we built something that was strong enough for the street, but smart enough for everything else? The 12 bolt was GM's Goldilocks solution. Not too heavy, not too light. Not overbuilt, not underbuilt. Just right. But don't let that fool you into thinking it was weak. This rear end lived behind some of the most abused engines in automotive history. SS Chevelles running 454 big blocks. Z28 Camaros with solid lifter small blocks that love to rev high. GTO judges with Ram Air engines that made power everywhere. The genius was in the details. 12 bolts holding the ring gear instead of the usual 10. A carrier design that distributed stress better than anything else available. Axle shafts that were strong enough for serious power but light enough not to kill acceleration. Street racers discovered something beautiful about this setup. It was strong enough to handle a weekend warrior's worst behavior, but civilized enough for Monday morning commuting. You could launch hard at the local drag strip on Saturday night and drive to work on Monday without any drama. The aftermarket went absolutely crazy for these because GM put them in so many different cars, Camaros, Chevelle, Novas, Monte Carlos, even some trucks. You could find cores everywhere. Performance shops started offering rebuild services by the 80s. A properly built 12 bolt could handle 600 horsepower without breaking a sweat. But here's what made it legendary among budget builders. While the heavy hitters were expensive and hard to find, you could walk into almost any junkyard in America and find one of these. Maybe it came out of a Monte Carlo, Maybe a Chevelle. Didn't matter. Clean it up, rebuild it, and you had a rear end that could handle whatever your small block could dish out. The quarter-mile times tell the story. Cars running 12-bolt rears were consistently competitive with anything else out there. Not because they were the strongest, because they were the smartest balance of strength, weight, and availability. Even today, if you're building a classic muscle car that's going to see street and strip duty, this is probably your best choice. Not the most exotic, not the strongest, just the right answer for most situations. But that revolutionary rear end we keep talking about, the one that threw out everything everyone thought they knew, get ready. It's about to completely change 
this conversation. Part 4, Mopar, 8 and 3 quarters, The Underrated Warrior. Here's the rear end that Mopar fans will fight you over. While everyone else was building bigger, heavier, more complex rear axles, Chrysler's engineers had a different idea. What if we took the best features from everyone else and packaged them in something that was actually smart? The eight and three quarters borrowed the removable center section idea from Ford, but instead of making it massive and heavy, they made it efficient. You got all the convenience of being able to change gear ratios quickly, but in a package that didn't weigh as much as a small engine. Plymouth and Dodge guys loved this because it meant they could run different setups for different purposes. Street gears for cruising, strip gears for racing, and swapping between them was a Saturday afternoon project instead of a week-long nightmare. But the real genius was in how it handled power. This rear end had a secret weapon that most people never noticed. Perfect geometry, the pinion angle, the ring gear position, even the way the axle shafts connected to the carrier. Everything was designed to work together under heavy acceleration. Instead of fighting itself like some rear ends do, this thing would actually get stronger as the loads increased. Street racers figured this out first. While guys with other rear ends were constantly dealing with broken axle shafts or damaged carriers, the Mopar guys were just driving hard and letting the engineering do its job. Here's a story that sums it up perfectly. There was a local drag racer, let's call him Tony, who had a dart with a built small block and one of these rear ends. Every Friday night, guys with stronger rear axles would challenge him. Tony would just smile and say, Let's see what happens. Most of the time, Tony would win. Not because his rear end was stronger on paper, because it was smarter in practice. The aftermarket caught on eventually. Companies started making stronger versions, but the basic design stayed the same. Because when something works this well, you don't mess with perfection. Even today, serious Mopar builders swear by these, not just out of loyalty, because they work, really, really well. But that game-changing rear end we've been teasing, the one that proved there was a completely different way to think about this entire problem, here it comes. And it's going to start arguments that are still going on today. Part 5. The Curveball. Corvette IRS. 1963. While every muscle car in America was running solid rear axles, Chevrolet did something that should have gotten their engineers fired. They gave the Corvette independent rear suspension, not an evolutionary improvement, not a small upgrade, a complete philosophical revolution that threw out 60 years of automotive wisdom and said, we're going to try something completely different. Every other manufacturer looked at this and said, are you insane? Solid axles were proven. They were strong. They were simple. They worked. But Chevy's engineers had been watching European sports cars and noticed something interesting. Cars with independent rear suspension didn't just handle better. They put power down more effectively because each wheel could react to the road surface independently. The drag racing community absolutely hated it at first. These things were complex. They had more moving parts. They were harder to modify. And worst of all, they couldn't handle the same abuse as a solid axle. But street drivers started noticing something amazing. The Corvette didn't just go fast in a straight line. It could actually go around corners without feeling like it was about to swap ends. Road racing guys were the first to really get it. While muscle cars with solid axles were sliding around tracks like boats in a bathtub, the Corvette was carving through turns with surgical precision. Here's where it gets really interesting. The independent setup was actually lighter than a comparable solid axle. Less unsprung weight meant better acceleration, better braking, better everything that wasn't just straight line drag racing. But the real revolution wasn't in the performance numbers. It was in proving that there was another way to think about putting power to the ground. Instead of brute force, precision. Instead of strength, intelligence. 
instead of fighting the road, working with it. The automotive press didn't know what to make of it. This wasn't just a better mousetrap. This was a completely different kind of mouse. By the 70s, other manufacturers started paying attention. By the 80s, independent rear suspension was becoming common. By the 90s, it was expected. But it all started with one crazy decision in 1963 to throw out the rule book and try something that shouldn't have worked but changed everything. Five rear ends. Five completely different approaches to the same basic problem. How do you get power from the engine to the pavement without breaking everything in between? The 9-inch said build it stronger than anything that could possibly break it. The 60 said make it so tough that failure becomes impossible. The 12 bolt said find the perfect balance and nail it. The 8 and 3 quarters said work smarter, not just harder. And the Corvette said, what if we're asking the wrong question entirely? But here's what they all had in common. Every single one of these rear ends was the result of engineers who refused to accept that good enough was actually good enough. They weren't building parts. They were solving problems. How do you handle a Hemi's torque without exploding? How do you make a rear end that racers can actually work with? How do you build something strong enough for the track, but civilized enough for the street? Every burnout that ever happened, every drag race victory, every muscle car legend that got built in someone's garage, every street race that became a lifelong story. None of it happens without these chunks of iron doing their job perfectly when everything else was on the line. The solid axles built the muscle car era. They were strong, simple, and nearly indestructible. But when Chevrolet bolted independent suspension under the Corvette, they showed everyone that the future wasn't just about being stronger, it was about being better. From the Ford 9-inch that refuses to die, to the Dana 60 that never learned how to quit, to the GM 12 bolt that found the perfect middle ground, to the Mopar 8 and 3 quarters that proved intelligence beats brute force to the Corvette's independent setup that dared to be different. These weren't just rear ends. They were the engineering marvels that put muscle to the pavement. And the next time someone tries to tell you that horsepower is everything, remind them that all the power in the world doesn't mean anything if you can't get it to the ground. That's where these five legends lived, in that crucial moment between power and motion, between intention and reality between dreaming about going fast and actually doing it. The rear-end wars weren't just about engineering. They were about making speed possible for everyone brave enough to step on the gas and hold on.